In the past year, we've seen vehicular terrorist attacks in France, the United States, Germany, and Great Britain. And given the success of these attacks, I doubt we've seen the last of them. Now, when we see a pattern emerging, the normal human reaction is to try to understand and explain the pattern. Unfortunately, the media have been so thoroughly conditioned not to understand terrorist attacks, it seems they've given up on trying to explain them for us. And when reporters throw their hands up in the air and admit defeat, that's when our hero, D. Wood, steps in to show yet again that this is so incredibly simple, a lobotomized baboon could understand it. But before we turn our attention specifically to vehicular jihad, here's a quick review of jihad in general for first-time viewers who didn't see my last 30 videos about jihad. In Sahih Muslim 7258, Muhammad explains a vision in which Allah showed him that Islam will dominate the entire world. He says, Allah drew the ends of the earth together for me to see, and I saw its eastern and western lands, and I saw that the dominion of my ummah will reach as far as that which was drawn together for me to see. What was drawn together for him to see? The ends of the earth, and his ummah, the Muslim community, will dominate all of it, the east and the west. How is this going to happen? Through peaceful preaching? <laughs> no, through fighting. In Sahih Muslim 129, Muhammad declares, I have been commanded to fight the people until they bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and they establish the Salat and pay Zakat. If they do that, then their blood and wealth are protected from me, except for a right that is due, and their reckoning will be with Allah. Notice, when are your blood and property protected from Muhammad? When you mind your own business and follow your own religion? <laughs> no, when you become an obedient Muslim, not before. Now, as Muhammad fought to violently subjugate the world, what was his most effective tactic? Apologetics? <laughs> no, terror. In Sahih al-Bukhari 2977, Muhammad proclaims, I have been made victorious with terror. Terror is the favorite tactic of the founder of Islam. It is wrong to describe this as Islamic terrorism. It is Islamist terrorism. It is a perversion of a great faith. Congratulations, Great Britain. You've managed to elect a government that's utterly incapable of reading words off a page. But David, if Muhammad promoted terrorism, why are there so many peaceful Muslims? Thank you for asking a question that I've answered hundreds of times. The assumption that underlies this question is that if a religion commands something, all or most of the adherents of this religion will obey the command. And this is total nonsense. In Matthew 5, verse 48, Jesus commands Christians to be perfect. Not one single Christian has ever obeyed this command. And yet, Christians not obeying the command has absolutely nothing to do with whether Jesus commanded it. Likewise, Islam commands its adherents to violently subjugate non-Muslims. There are, of course, millions of Muslims who have no intention of ever obeying this command. And yet, Muslims not obeying the command has absolutely nothing to do with whether Allah and Muhammad commanded it. The real question here is why some Muslims obey Allah and Muhammad while other Muslims don't. As I pointed out in my video, The Jihad Triangle, Jihad isn't simply the product of belief in Islam. Jihad also requires a Muslim to know what Islam teaches about Jihad, many Muslims don't, and to have a certain personality type, the personality of someone who does what he's told, even if it's going to cost him his life. Many people aren't like this, but some are. When all three features are combined, when a person believes in Islam, knows what Islam commands about jihad, and has the requisite personality type, we get a jihadi.
But when a jihadi is born, he's faced with a number of options. The world is very different from what it was 14 centuries ago when Allah and Muhammad commanded Muslims to wage jihad, and jihad took on a number of forms even in 7th century Arabia. So there are a range of options available to the newborn jihadi. But what are the main options? Well, first, if the jihadi has always wanted to travel and see the world, he can join a foreign terrorist group. If he decides to go this route, he's faced with a further decision, namely, which group do I join? Do I join Al-Qaeda or ISIS or Al-Shabaab or the Taliban or some other group? Second, the jihadi might decide to wage jihad in his own country. And here, he'll face the further decision of how to go about this. Do I learn to build bombs, or try to get a bomb from someone else, or get some guns or knives, or get in a car or truck and drive it into a crowd of people? Now, the options open to the domestic jihadi vary in two important ways. One, they vary in the amount of preparation required, and two, they vary in the degree of impact. In other words, learning to build bombs can take a significant amount of time, years, if you're thinking of something beyond a pressure cooker or a pipe bomb. But the results can be pretty terrifying if you manage to blow up a bunch of people. Guns may be more or less difficult to acquire depending on where you live and who you know, and the impact may be more or less potent depending on how quickly someone's going to shoot back. Grabbing some knives from your kitchen drawer is simple enough, but the outcome probably won't be particularly devastating. You can only stab or slash so many people before you're shot or tackled. Or you can get in an SUV or something larger and drive it into a crowd of people. Notice that the vehicular option doesn't take much preparation and that you can potentially inflict a lot of casualties so long as you have a heavy enough vehicle and a sizable crowd of people. So if you're weighing your options and you don't think you'd be a good bomb maker and you think you'll have a tough time getting a gun and you want to do something more than just stab a few people, vehicular jihad is going to catch your eye. Another option. For people who don't want to die, there's the option of supporting jihad financially. Muhammad himself said that people who pay for others to wage jihad receive the same reward as the jihadis who fight. So if you've got a business or a good job, you might decide to fund jihadis. This is why we've seen so many cases of people being charged with sending money or supplies to various terrorist groups. Even groups like CARE have been caught conspiring to fund terrorist groups. Finally, you might believe that you're supposed to wage jihad, but you might not like any of the options currently available, so you might decide to wait patiently. Here you're waiting for something to come along that jumps out at you as a mission from Allah. You're convinced that you're called to fight, but you're not convinced that any of the options currently on the table is the way to go. Hence, you wait. And polls show that many people who agree with jihadi doctrine aren't actually waging jihad. They're waiting. So now we're in a position to understand the rise of vehicular jihad. Years ago, Al-Qaeda set the bar for a successful terrorist attack pretty high. A successful terrorist attack was crashing planes into buildings or blowing up subway stations, mass casualties, go big or go home. And for years, aspiring jihadis attempted to recapture the success of the 9-11 attacks or the 7-7 bombings, and they failed. Over and over again, jihadis would get caught trying to buy bombs from undercover FBI agents. They would then go to prison, and instead of inflicting terror, they convinced us that the FBI is really on top of things. Eventually, a few jihadis concluded that successful small-scale attacks would be better than failed large-scale attacks. So instead of plotting to blow up a building, they would grab a knife or an axe or a gun or a small pressure cooker bomb and go stab or hack or shoot or blow up a few people in the name of Allah. These small-scale attacks wouldn't be as dramatic as the 9-11 attacks or the 7-7 bombings, but they were much more difficult to stop than large-scale attacks. But even though small-scale attacks are more difficult to prevent, they're not always impossible to stop. Police can keep an eye on people who buy guns or who download instructions to build pressure cooker bombs. If someone's carrying a backpack onto a train, police can tell him to open his bag. But how do you stop someone from getting in his SUV and driving it into a crowd of people? 
until he's plowing through the people, he hasn't done anything. How do you stop someone from renting a U-Haul truck and heading towards a local parade? You can't. And jihadis are now recognizing that for those of them who don't want to join a foreign terrorist group and don't want to support jihad financially and don't want to wait indefinitely and don't have access to bombs or guns and would like to do something more spectacular than stab someone, the best rewards to risk ratio is vehicular jihad. Extremely low risk of getting caught before the attack, very high rewards in terms of terror, casualties, and injuries. It took jihadis a while to realize this, but after a few successful attacks, they've caught on. Now, there are really only two things you can do to deal with jihad. You can refute the ideology that leads to the attacks, or you can try to minimize or prevent the attacks once they're in motion. Our leaders have done less than nothing when it comes to refuting the ideology of jihadis. I say less than nothing because nothing would have been keeping their mouths shut. They haven't kept their mouths shut. Instead, they've defended and promoted Muhammad and the Quran, the sources of jihadi doctrine. So the ideology of jihadis has spread. That leaves our leaders with the task of preventing individual attacks and trying to minimize the damage of attacks they can't prevent. Improvements in security and surveillance have been remarkably successful in preventing most large-scale attacks, but this has pushed jihadis towards small-scale attacks. Given the options available to small-scale jihadis who don't have access to guns, vehicular jihad is just as easy as a knife attack, but far more deadly. And that's why we're going to be seeing more of these attacks. So stay alert when you're in a crowded area and learn to refute Islam so that future generations don't have to depend on politicians to keep them safe from Muhammad's teachings.